It's the Bitter Southerner podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting and the magazine I edit, The Bitter Southerner. My name is Chuck Reese, and this is episode two of our first season, and today we're talking about food. Good food can do more than just satisfy a craving. With the right ingredients, the texture, the smell, the taste, they can make powerful statements. And Chef Tunde Wei knows how to work those combinations very well. Add salt, and if it tastes good, then you are winning in life. In his home kitchen in New Orleans, Tunde Wei makes his own special version of jollof rice. It's a spicy one-pot dish from his home country in Nigeria. You can find Tunde's recipe for jollof rice easily online, but in this version, he's adding iru, I-R-U, a paste made of fermented locust beans, which are native to his home in West Africa. The way I cook it, I, I cook the rice, and then I smoke it by burning the bottom of the pot. And so it's smoky, it's spicy, and then it's like, has this mint or licorice thing going on. You see, those kinds of personal touches have contributed to Southern food for a long time. People from other cultures arrive here, and their knowledge adds a little something extra to the gumbo that is the South. So I'm putting the iru with the onions. Many chefs in our region have developed a keener appreciation of the hands that labor to produce their ingredients, but when it comes to starting conversations about food and social justice, few people are sharper than Chef Tunde Wei. The opportunity to enjoy different kinds of food that are unfamiliar already exist within us, just like language. You know, like we have the, capa the capacity to formulate and learn language. I think we have the capacity to enjoy all kinds of foods. We just need to put ourselves in those spaces. Earlier this year, Chef Wei began an experiment in New Orleans. Now this experiment was designed to make the gap in income between black people and white people in that city crystal clear. I asked folks who identified as white to pay two and a half times more, which was $30. And the price differential reflects the racial income disparity in New Orleans. In the end, the chef says nearly all of his white customers agreed to the higher rate. And at the end of the month, when the experiment concluded, he gave back the extra money to his non-white customers. White folks uh, were mostly surprised. Well, everyone was surprised, but I think white folks were trying to grapple with what to do. 80% of the white folks who came through decided to pay the 30, 20% didn't. But Way says that even those 20% who didn't pay did understand why his social experiment was important. Because you see, in the South, food is never just food. So today on the Bitter Southerner podcast, we're going down to the crossroads of two topics that are unavoidable in this region, food and race. If you want to talk about the intersection of food, race, and culture in the South, perhaps the first thing you need to address is the terminology. For instance, when people talk about Southern food and soul food, are they talking about the same thing? The food that I grew up on was soul food. That's Savannah, Georgia chef Mashama Bailey. Her restaurant is called The Gray, and in 2018, the James Beard Foundation nominated her for its Best Chef Southeast Award. That made Mashama Bailey the first African-American woman in the foundation's history to get a Best Chef nomination in any category. It was basically what my mom put in the pot, and um, she seasoned it how she wanted to. She grew up on that food. I think Southern food is a, a, a little bit more regional. It's more, um, it's broader, I think. It's also the difference between a hymn and a Negro spiritual. That's Chef Carla Hall. She's a native of Nashville and author of the book Carla Hall's Soul Food, Every Day and Celebration. 
In an interview with NPR's Morning Edition, she describes the difference between soul food and southern food this way. You know, you can sing the same song, but even if, if you were doing a note like, ah, and then you have somebody like, mm, 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 those other notes that are being sung are not on the paper, but it is something about feeling that song and where that emotion came from. So that is like our food. It is, it's a, and I don't want to say it's a stank on it, but it's a stank on it. Now, you might have heard me, if you listened to episode one, talking about how I learned as an adult that the songs I had sung in the church choir of my youth were simultaneously being sung in black churches, just differently. It's the same dynamic that Carla Hall was talking about. And when you really dive into that topic with African-American chefs, you learn the term soul food connotes something deeper than just food from the American South. It's about recipes and food ways, traditions inside families and communities, and how those are passed down through the generations, and importantly, the emotions and the spirits woven into that history. Here's Carla Hall again. I think there's a small piece that people know of soul food. When you go to a soul food restaurant, the people who own that restaurant are going to give you those celebration dishes that are going to bring you in. When you are around the table and people from the outside come into your home, you're celebrating. So, of course, you're going to have mac and cheese and smothered pork chops and fried chicken and ribs and all of these things because that's what you do. Even in other cultures, that's what you do. So I think that soul food got stuck there because this is what people are eating because they're celebrating and going to restaurants. But people weren't having fried chicken every day because... They couldn't kill their chickens. They needed the eggs. They needed the eggs. I love that because it simplifies things for us. See, we're just talking about poor folks in the rural South and taking the ingredients that they had at hand, the things they raised and grew, and how they did all they could to make them delicious, to fill the bellies of their families with pleasure in places where the pleasures were few. In other words, it's these family and community traditions that are passed down that matter. And of course, because these techniques and recipes came from poor folks, they rarely made it into cookbooks or into the curricula of culinary schools. Even though Mashama Bailey grew up eating the soul food cooked by her mama, who was raised in Waynesville, Georgia, a deeper dive into her own food heritage was tough. You research and you read cookbooks and um, you read old receipts and you start to um, put the pieces together. You ask questions. You investigate, I think. Um, That's really how I learned. Mashama Bailey's Beard Award nomination marked a long overdue recognition of African-American women in the kitchen. And she says another thing that's overdue is greater appreciation and deeper study of the food ways of the rural poor people of the South and every other American region. Those things she believes ought to be part of standard culinary schooling, but they are not. When I went to culinary school, um, we learned about all the European sort of um, diets and how they ate and cooked and their techniques. And you don't really, you don't learn anything about American food. They think of it as sort of like a melting pot, more of, um, you know, tradition. Um, We're growing older as a country and we're starting to identify ourselves um, more regionally, I think. And I think that's the importance of uh, really classifying different parts of the United States and and, and how we grow food and how we cook food and and different techniques. Uh, They're pit masters and and, um, fishermen and oystermen and all these people have different cooking techniques. And I think that needs to be celebrated in culinary schools in America, and they're not yet, I don't think. But a deeper appreciation of food from the South and all the cultures within it cannot be where this discussion ends, because there are even deeper questions underneath. Who owns Southern food? To whom do we, as eaters, owe our gratitude, our thanks? I mean, we can stand around the table blessing the food and the hands that made it every day. But how much do we actually think about how many hands of how many different colors 
labored to put that food on our table. In 2017, we were awfully lucky to get two of the best books ever written about those questions. One was The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty. The other was The Pot Liquor Papers by John T. Edge. Just ahead, I'll talk with John T., but first, let's hear from Michael Twitty. He won the 2018 Beard Foundation Award for Book of the Year with The Cooking Gene. And Georgia Public Broadcasting's Tony Harris asked Twitty why he wanted to write about these difficult subjects. You know, that's a really good and provocative question. Who owns Southern food? Uh, what do you say to people who will hear that and, and, and want to know? First of all, is that really a question? Is, is that something to be debated? Well, we all know who owned black people in 1860, don't we? Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, ownership is, you know, in a capitalist society, ownership and fences are very important. We're learning that the hard way, aren't we? Mm. So I would say that my answer is very nice and philosophical, and it goes like this. Who owns Southern food? Whoever is going to take responsibility for owning its past um, maintaining its present and securing its future in a positive and forward-leaning way. So it's not, for me, it's not about whether your phenotype is European or African or in between or native um, or anything else. It has to do with your values and how you look at the history of the food and understand that it, this Southern food is a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. But it came at a tremendous hu tremendous human cost. And if we don't acknowledge that and acknowledge the other surrounding issues, economics, uh, health, um, re mm. racial reconciliation, we're not doing our job. Culinary justice. You want culinary justice. What does that mean? Well, culinary justice is what happens when people who have been historically um, oppressed are able to reap the full benefit of their cultural production through food. And it means giving um, people of color, poor folks. I mean, we, we're seeing an up, I, I want to make sure everybody knows that we're already seeing an, an, an uplift in terms of um, poor white Appalachian foodways. And yet, the same issues are there that they are in the African American community in the South. Mm -hmm. Not having, not being able to get, you know, brick and mortar businesses, not being able to take advantage of of certain spaces, having that food be represented outside the community in different ways than it is within the community. The um, lack of support for the knowledge bearers of those food traditions. So for me, culinary justice has a lot to do with uh, quote-unquote race, but not everything to yeah. do with quote-unquote race. It, it affects anybody and everybody whose food tradition is um, unfortunately not a means of uplift. When you were researching uh, Cooking Gene, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about food? I think people don't understand how many ways food affects, you know, decisions. For example, Let's do a quick ver quick run through history okay. of slavery and food. Sugarcane is really the catalyst crop of slavery. So in other words, put it like this: somebody living ten thousand years ago in New Guinea, who had a who, you know every human being has a sweet tooth because that's na that's a natural thing. You know that's part of our makeup, evolutionary makeup, to look for sweet things for energy. Mm -hmm. So that person was thirsty. They cracked open a reed. They tasted really sweet. They began to domesticate it. The people in New Guinea say that the sugar cane is part of their, their, the root of humankind. So there's this thing where the food becomes part of the family tree. So if you're Native American, it's corn. If you're from eastern Nigeria, where the ancestors of 25% of all African Americans came from, mm -hmm. it's the yam. But just that idea that, that one day someone had a sweet tooth and that plant crossed the crossed the globe and eventually led to, hmm, let's grow a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, Native Americans won't be our enslaved people. Let's go get Africans. And that's when the story begins. 
So, Michael, this is okay. So, this is amazing to me. So, as a person who who doesn't view food, and I I see this as a, a bit of a failing of mine, right? As a person who doesn't view food through kind of a historical lens, as as symbolic of things, who who, who didn't grow up seeing the narrative of food as clearly as you do, explain to me and others <laughs> like me uh, what we've been missing all this time. You know, something, it's these, what I call food prints. You know, um, it's more than just, I think one well, of the first problem we have is that in our culture today, we rarely get beyond three generations mm. of cultural, mem- cultural and familial memory. Um, in the past, even without, you know, literacy, without computers, without digitizing things, people's memory was a lot longer. And so those narratives really sustain people through a lot of tragedies and through a lot of failures. But um, it it really goes down to that. I mean, I'm Jewish also, and people find that to be exotic, and I personally don't. And, you know, every every year, Passover, you know, eating those symbolic foods. Um, But also just the, the meal itself, people bringing things that have been a part of their family's existence for several hundred years. And being able to tell stories around them, well, as African American, I do the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that Sunday dinner context, um, with that reunion context. I mean, these foods have memory attached to them. Why do we eat that? Right. Because so and so in the country, and we did this, and we did that. Having that sort of um, contextual background that you're told by your elders that you can pass on to your children makes all the difference in the world. It, it, it is part of the flavor of the food. What do you want people to ultimately uh, take away from reading this book? Well, I, I want people to understand it's really hard. <laughs> um, that word American is a loaded term for us, and it's not easy to connect to. It's also not easy to connect to the word African. Um, you're kind of caught suspended, you know, you know suspended animation you know, like a piece of watermelon and jello salad. For African Americans, this book tends to be a blueprint, a guide for finding their own culinary story and their own genetic story. Mm. For living history people, it's it's like it's like, okay, when you do interpretation of slavery, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. And for food historians, the importance in Southern food, it's this is the story from our perspective. Yeah. Lend me your ears. That's James Beard Award-winning author Michael Twitty speaking with Georgia Public Broadcasting's Tony Harris. Among the many lessons in his book, The Pot Liquor Papers, John T. Edge taught us about civil rights icons who made their mark through food. One such story was about Georgia Gilmore. In the 1950s, Ms. Gilmore led a group of women in Montgomery, Alabama. In their home kitchens and in the backs of beauty salons, they made baked goods that they sold to raise money for carpools. And why did they need carpools? To take black people to work during the Montgomery bus boycott. This group called itself the Club from Nowhere, and it was the brainchild of Georgia Gilmore. She died in 1990, but she did talk about the club in a 1986 interview for the PBS series Eyes on the Prize. And so the club from nowhere was able to report maybe 150, 125, or 75, or maybe $200 or more a week, and which was very nice for the people because so many of the people who didn't attend the mass meeting would give the donation to help keep the car food going. Georgia Gilmore is just one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement whose stories were told by John T. Edge in his book, The Pot Liquor Papers. John T. directs the Southern Foodways Alliance, and he has since its beginning 20 years ago. The first time I attended an SFA event, the theme came straight out of an old Carter family song I'd heard long ago. Who's welcome at the welcome table? I'm gonna eat at the welcome table, oh yes, I'm gonna eat at the 
And at that SFA symposium, I saw something I had never seen before. A group of Southerners who had assembled not only to enjoy great food and drink, as Southerners are wont to do, but also to explore how our food does or should bring us together across the lines of class and race. In Nashville recently, I talked to John T. about how the SFA strikes that balance. That balance has got to be keen. Mm -hmm. If you tip one way or the other, if you got too much drink and too much great food and not enough thought, not enough um, willingness to go deep and hard into our past and our present, then everything falls apart. It seems to me that like one of the problems of, or one of the challenges that you have by coming at social justice through the lens of food is how do you scale that idea? How do you reach more people than can fit into your symposiums to have those conversations? Well, and that, I mean, that's the express challenge that we have taken on in the last five years. You know, one of the things I've heard from people of late, a number of old guard members of the Southern Food Waste Alliance, people who attended symposia and, um, and have donated money to the Southern Food Waste Alliance, have begun to challenge us on our focus on new Southerners, our want to say, this is not just about black and white. This is not just about Western Europe and West Africa. This is not just about old problems, but they're new ones um, that sound and smell and stink just like the old ones. Right. Um, And, you know, we are not stepping away from that. Like these ideals, um, these welcome table ideals, this want to believe and, and to make real the promise of a table where everyone can gather, that includes our newly arrived brothers and sisters. And they are redefining Southern food just as it's been redefined generation after generation after generation. The South is a process, not a product. And I welcome um, immigrants from Southeast Asia. I welcome immigrants from Mexico. I welcome immigrants from Guatemala. My money is on them, not on old hate and division. Another guest on this podcast is someone that you know really well, Michael Twitty. Mm -hmm. Michael talks a lot and has written a lot about the idea of culinary justice. What, What does that term mean to you? It means different things to Michael and to me. Michael, um, a black son of the South, and me, a white son of the South. For a white son of the South, it means paying down debts of pleasure. And I borrow that phrase from John Edgerton, my mentor, um, and I use it fairly often because I I intend it. Um, It means for white sons of the South to say not only the first name of the cook who raised them and they considered their family and praise all the high Hosanna, it means to say their last name too. Um, It means to dig deep into our history and regard the cooks who came before us. And it means to look into our future and say the first and last names of the immigrant cooks who now fuel Southern kitchens. That's what culinary justice is. That's how it begins, at least. Um, All these things we're talking about are kind of theoretical. Um, The question is, how do you apply this in real life, in real time? I endorse anything that helps bring Southerners of different cultures together Mm -hmm. to have these discussions. Right. You know, and I do think food was a brilliant way to do it because we must all eat. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a given. And and food gives us access to apprehending labor. You know, it gives us access to talking about and thinking about um, the people who have long done the work in the South. And that's been people of color. That's been women. You know, and both groups that pasty white people like me and you with penises have long denied. This is true. This is true. But I do think our eyes are opening more to it now. I think our eyes are opening. um, And, um, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do as I move forward in this world 
is to regard these problems and think about these challenges and embrace possible solutions, not out of guilt, but out of progressive intent. Because guilt ends up being about me. Um, and progressive intent means I'm going to do something about it instead of wallowing in it. A question, last question. Do you think the history of Southern food is racist? I think the history of the South is racist. Yes. And Southern food depends upon the history of the South. So connect the dots, man. This is a place built on racism. Um, and I live a life emboldened by racism. Um, it doesn't mean I can't reject it. I'm doing everything in my bone to reject that. But until we reconcile the fact that um, the institutions of this region, the creations of this region, um, were made possible by white supremacy um, and by beautiful and tragic reactions to that white supremacy and rejections of that white supremacy, um, we can't get anywhere. Um, it, it, I mean, one thing that that's, I think is important to do when we talk about the South, if we talk about racism, we're really talking about white imprint on black culture and the ways in which white people and white supremacy um, have negatively impacted and thwarted black people and black culture. But if you flip it and you center the story of the South on black triumph and black creativity, you tell a whole different story of the South and you center it on people of color. And that's what I'm learning. And that's what I hope the story of the future of the South looks like, is looking at regarding those people, that culture, with as much openness um, and kindness, gentleness, this is possible. That was John T. Edge. He directs the Southern Foodways Alliance, which is part of the University of Mississippi's Center for the Study of Southern Culture. And personally, I couldn't agree more when he says the South is a process, not a product. And today, you've heard from several people in the South who have dedicated their lives to pushing that process forward into the future. Believe what you may but there are way more folks like that here than you know about. Keep coming back and you'll meet more of them. And that's it for the Bitter Southerner podcast today. Of course, we want to hear from you. Hit us up on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Tell us your own stories about those moments when you tried to go beyond blessing the food to blessing the hands that made it. You can always listen to our show at bittersouthern.com. You can subscribe anywhere podcasts are found, and we hope you do. Our site is also where you can read our stories and check out the show notes for links to specific pieces that will tell you more about the people you met today. For instance, you can dive a little deeper into the thinking of Michael Twitty and John T. Edge. Our producer is the mighty, mighty Sean Power. Sarah Shariari edits the show. Patterson Hood composed our theme music. It's performed by his band, The Drive-By Truckers, and the song, if you don't know it already, is called Ever South. We also played you a little snippet of the legendary Carter family's River of Jordan. Special thanks to our friend Sean Chavis of the Forklore Podcast for helping with this episode. The Bitter Southerner Podcast is a co-production of Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Bitter Southerner Magazine. I'm Chuck Reese. I have three suggestions for you. Hug more necks, abide no hatred, and always do what you love with who you love. See you on the next show.